so much. Uh, thanks for having me here today. This is a fantastic event about important issues, and I'm looking forward to working on these issues with all of you. So what am I going to try to do in the next 25 minutes? Well, today I'm going to be arguing that something that has seemed like a good measure of fairness to many people, that is, equalizing false positive rates, is actually not a measure of fairness at all. So there's this growing literature that says that we face a fairness trade-off between two kinds of fairness. Those are called calibration and equal false positive rates. And this framing, which you can see in these passages, assumes that both calibration and equal false positive rates are measures of fairness. In contrast to this framing, I'm going to argue that despite initial appearances, equal false positive rates are actually an irrelevant measure and they don't set a good standard for algorithmic fairness. Now, of course, sometimes we should change procedures in ways that will equalize false positive rates, but I think this is incidental, and I think people have been wrong to focus on equalizing false positive rates, per se. So a result of this is that this very common fairness trade-off framing is somewhat misleading, and it's led to mistaken priorities. So I'm going to do four things in this talk. First, I'm going to present a famous case study, which is probably familiar to many of you, and that's the Compass algorithm, which is used to predict recidivism. Second, I'm going to go over the measures of fairness that people have proposed and explain how they're incompatible with each other. I'll probably have to go a little more quickly through that than I'd like, but I'm always happy to talk more about that in Q&A. Third, I'm going to make my arguments. And fourth, I'm going to tell you why things really complicated. So just so there's no suspense, these are going to be the main claims. I'm going to say that a measure called calibration is a good measure of fairness. In particular, it's a necessary condition for procedural fairness. And then I'm going to argue that false positive rate equality is neither necessary nor sufficient for procedural fairness. I just want to say at the outset that I, I'm not denying that there are many extremely unfair things about pretrial detention and the compass algorithm in particular, but I think that this particular measure is just not the right thing to focus on if you're trying to make things more fair. So here's the case study. So compass is an algorithm that predicts recidivism based on age, sex, and arrest history. And people hope that programs like Compass can make pretrial detention decisions quicker, more fair, and more equitable. But there have rightly been a lot of worries about these. And I'm going to be focusing on one particular worry, which was raised by ProPublica. So Compass gives scores from 1 to 10, where 10 is the highest risk of rearrest. And ProPublica, in their analysis, bends these scores into two categories, a low risk category and a high-risk category. That's going to be relevant for some of the measures that we talk about. So what did ProPublica find? I trust many of you have probably seen this report. ProPublica wrote that, oh, oh. Hmm. I'll plug it back in. Oh, we're back. So ProPublica wrote that Compass is an unfair and a biased algorithm. Why did they claim this? Because they found that the two following metrics are unequal. But this chart is somewhat ambiguous. So labeled higher risk but didn't reoffend could refer to one of two different metrics. So here's one thing that it could be referring to. It could be measuring how many errors there are as a share of predictions. That is, how often is it right or wrong as a share of the times that it labels someone as high risk. And this number is often called the positive predictive value of the high risk category. So that's one thing that they could be referring to by the phrase labeled higher risk but didn't do that. But there's a second thing that it could mean. It could be measuring errors as a share of outcomes. That is, false positives as a share of those who did not, in fact, reoffend. And this is called the false positive rate. And it matters because actually these two things are in tension. This is a pretty commonly discussed result that they're in tension, as we'll see. 
So just to get clear on this stuff, we need to do a little bit of work just to look at the different measures that get debated. So starting with the simple stuff, in this prediction problem, uh, and in all prediction problems, you can look at two types of errors, false positives and false negatives. So a false positive is where someone is predicted to be high risk, but they're in fact not re-arrested, while a false negative is the other kind of error. I'm actually going to talk about false positives and false negatives in terms of decisions in an analogous way. I'm going to speak in that way for much of the talk. So we're going to call a false positive detention when someone is detained and they were needlessly detained. Say they were predicted to be high risk of rearrest, but they really weren't. And a false negative is someone who is not detained, but then is rearrested. So let's get back to the ProPublica result. So the company that makes Compass pointed out that their scores are calibrated <coughs> between regions. And that means that a given Compass score corresponds to the same frequency of rearrest, regardless of race. So defendants that have a score of eight, say, are equally likely to be rearrested, whether they're black or white. So in this sense, at least, Compass is not over-predicting rearrest for black defendants versus white defendants. So this looks like a prima facie desirable trait for a tool to have. How is this compatible with what ProPublica found? So it turns out that what ProPublica was looking at is the false positive rate, which looks at errors as a share of outcomes. And so the key point for a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is that calibration is a measure that looks at, at false positives or tracks false positives as a share of predictions or of decisions made on those predictions. And in contrast, the false positive rate measures false positives as a share of a given outcome. And that's what allows these things to be intentioned. So this is a, just a very famous result that's been discussed a lot that says that these two things are in tension. It's called, some people have called it the central impossibility. Um, if you have two populations that have unequal base rates, then you can't have both calibration and equality of the false positive rates. Now I'm actually going to use a slightly different version of this that talks about decision in terms of prediction, but there's a straightforward way to translate the two, which I can talk about more. So just to review what ProPublica found, uh, not ProPublica, ProPublica, um, was a result of the following things. In the jurisdiction that they study, black defendants do have a higher base rate of rearrest. Compass is calibrated between black defendants and white defendants. And as a result of those, you're just necessarily going to have unequal false positives. And if you haven't seen this result before, just to give you like the mathematical intuitions behind it, basically, if a group has a higher base rate, that means that a calibrated tool is going to predict proportionally more of them as high risk, and that's going to increase the number of false positives and the number of true positives. And that higher base rate also means that the total number of non-rearrested people is going to be lower. So both of those things together are going to drive the false positive rate higher for any group that has a higher base rate of the thing that's being predicted. So how that happened in the Compass case is you can see that while the high risk category is has about equal chance of being correct for either uh, class of defendants, because there's different shares of non-rearrested, that means that the false positive rate is going to come out unequal. So this is just kind of visually trying to give you the intuition that I, I gave to motivate the central possibility. Um, so again, what ProPublica found was false positive rates that were unequal as a result of calibration and base rate differences. And this is a general result. This is going to apply to any procedure, not just statistical ones, not just things in machine learning. So this trade-off would also arise if judges were making these decisions without the use of compass. And it's going to occur with any social groups that have base rate differences. And so that's going to happen in all sorts of prediction problems that we care about. And so this is a very important problem for us to face up to. So here's the impossibility result in the way that I'm going to be talking about it. Uh, you'll just have to trust me that this is kind of an equivalent formulation. If you're applying an imperfect prediction tool to two populations with unequal base rates, you can't have calibrated scores 
uniform <coughs> decision thresholds and false positive rate equality. To understand that, we need to talk a little bit about what decision thresholds are. Fortunately, we're about to do that. Okay, in a very simplifying model, and we'll talk about ways in which it should be complicated, we can think of this decision as a decision under uncertainty. And so there's a risk associated with each kind of error. So the risk of false positives are very vivid, that people are needlessly detained, and this obviously harms defendants quite terribly and also violates their rights. On the other hand, the risk of false negative is a flight risk or an increase in crime, at least according to the logic of pretrial detention, which is itself very problematic. But on this model, whether you're going to decide to detain or not to detain is going to be determined by the score and by your evaluation of how good or bad these possible outcomes are. So the worse false positives are, the higher you're going to set your decision threshold. And the worse false negatives are, the lower you're going to set it. This is just intuitively what happens in all sorts of decision processes. You're balancing against two kinds of errors, and you have to decide where the appropriate trade-off is between those. And so the worse false positives are, the more sure you want to be that you're not having one before you'll detain, and the worse false negatives are the other way. And so if you fix those values, which is not a trivial thing to do, that means that you're going to have some sort of optimal threshold <coughs> that's determined by how you want to make this trade-off. And that's going to be the one that minimizes an expectation the total badness from the different types of errors you can make. The key point here is just that we always face a trade-off between the badness of false positives and the badness of false negatives. And a different decision threshold is just a different way of making that trade-off. If you raise the threshold, you're going to decrease <coughs> false positives but increase false negatives, and if you lower it, the opposite will happen. So sort of embedded in any threshold of decision, if there's an implicit valuation of how bad you take false positives to be versus false negatives. And there's a lot of work for philosophy and politics and democracy to do in deciding how bad we think these errors are. And of course, context is going to matter quite a lot. The pretrial detention case is one of the hardest because we're balancing individuals' considerations versus community considerations. It's a mix of harms and rights violations. And it's often hard to know how to compare those things. We also might want to be prioritarians and make sure we're especially not harming people who are worse off. And so these considerations may mean that false positives are worse for members of some groups more than others, and that will arise later. The key thing is that you're going to have different optimal thresholds only if the group utilities differ. Remember, a threshold is just a way of making that trade-off. And so if you thought that false positives and false negatives were relevantly the same for all members that you're looking at, which would be a very idealized assumption, then you would have the same threshold for all defendants. And if you're going to have different decision thresholds, that might be because you evaluate the cost of these errors differently for different defendants. And there's one last uh, result that we need to keep in mind before I actually tell you my arguments, are that Adjusting the scores upward or downward for one group is just going to be an indirect way of changing the decision thresholds for members of that group. And that's why I put my essential impossibility in terms of thresholds. So uh, imagine there are two things we could do to change a process. We could say we're gonna move the decision threshold up by one, say move it from seven to eight, or we could adjust everyone's scores downward by one while holding that threshold fixed. Those two things, a little bit of algebra you can see, are just going to be equivalent. Those are going to be the same process that results in the same sorts of people getting detained or not detained. And so just again, that's why I put my possibility results in terms of decision thresholds. Time for some normative claims, because I am from the NYU Department of Philosophy after all. So no more, not much more math. So here's what I'm here to argue. I think that having a calibrated predictor is a necessary condition for procedural fairness. And as you've seen from the title of my talk, and I've already said before, false positive rate equality is actually not going to track procedural fairness. 
And as sort of a corollary of that, I think adjusting to achieve false positive rate equality is going to track the wrong things that we don't actually care about when we're trying to make decisions more fair or to protect vulnerable and oppressed people. So here's just an example of how miscalibration can be unfair. So suppose that we did have a miscalibrated procedure. That is a procedure where the scores meant different things for people of different groups. So let's say that in this process, an eight was associated with an 80% chance of rearrest for white defendants, but only a 60% chance of rearrest for black defendants. So in this sense, it's over-predicting rearrest among black defendants. What's going to happen if we detain people at this threshold of eight? Well, a white detainee who has an eight is going to have a 20% risk of error, of that being a needless detention. And a black detainee is going to have a 40% risk of error. And again, from what we just said, this is the same as if we had a calibrated tool but had a selectively lower decision threshold for black defendants. And these two things together, I think, would just be a straightforwardly case of differential treatment. It would be as if we were effectively applying a selectively lower threshold for black defendants. So if we had two defendants that we evaluated as equally risky, the black defendant would be detained, but the white defendant would not be. And so I think they would have a very strong complaint based on miscalibration that this procedure is selectively subjecting defendants like them to higher risk of error. And remember something I just said, a threshold is kind of a way of saying how much you value or disvalue false positives. And if you have a lower threshold for some people, in essence, you're not treating their false positives as seriously. You're more willing to subject people to the risk of false positives if you're more willing to detain them at a lower threshold. And note, because this will be important in my arguments against false positive rate equality, this kind of complaint is independent of base rates. So you could have a miscalibrated procedure that or conversely, you could have a calibrated procedure operating no matter what the base rate differences were. So for example, if we had a tool that was predicting violent crime, that could be calibrated between men and women, even though the base rate of violent crime is far higher for men. We wouldn't have to adjust anything as the base rates change. So just to sum up, I think that miscalibration straightforwardly is differential treatment, and importantly, it holds independently of just to throw in a caveat that I've already mentioned, I think group-specific thresholds can be appropriate because remember, it's not always going to be true that false positives and false negatives are equally bad for members of different groups. So that can be justification of different thresholds. That might be reasons for supplying them differently. But in the case that I just mentioned, that was a case where there were differential thresholds that seemed patently unfair because they were underweighting the harm of false positives for black people. So that's the first claim. Calibration is a necessary condition of fairness. If you're taking false positives and false negatives to be relevantly similar outcomes, then differential thresholds are unjustified differential treatment. Now again, that antecedent may not hold in a lot of cases, but this is a separate question from false positive rates. And when that antecedent does hold, then calibration and uniform thresholds are a necessary condition of procedural fairness. So that was the first claim. Now I'm going to consider various reasons that you might think that false positive rate equality is also desirable. Also, I focused almost exclusively on false positive rate equality and, and not on false negative rate equality, but I think equivalent things can be said about that as well. So just to clear, get this out of the way pretty quickly, I think one persistent source of confusion, at least in popular writing on this, is that false positive rate inequality sounds like miscalibration. As we saw earlier, if you express it in English, it's just ambiguous between the two. And I think that um, a, a lot of times when people write about the ProPublica result, it seems like they have in mind miscalibration. So you can see that in the TechCrunch thing. In this passage, they're wondering how this could have possibly happened if it's not using surrogate race indicators 
Well, when you appropriately understand what false positive rate and calibration are, you realize it actually results precisely because it's not selectively over-predicting or under-predicting. Um, and similarly, I think that second passage is just ambiguous between miscalibration and false positive rate clauses. That said, I think there are some more serious reasons you could think that false positive rate equality <coughs> matters. So I think we can make a claim that sounds a lot like the miscalibration claim. So imagine the compass case where we have false positive rate inequality, and imagine the following complaint. I was needlessly detained, and false positive rate inequality shows that I was more at risk of this error. After all, a greater share of non rearrested blacks are false positives. So this claim is very plausible on its face, and also this defendant does probably have a lot to complain about. But I think this particular complaint, based on false positive rate inequality, goes subtly wrong. <laughs> While miscalibration would show that this defendant was more at risk of error in virtue of his race, the use of a calibrated tool on populations with unequal base rates does not show that this risk is relevantly different. And let's see why. As I've said, I think false positive rate equality or inequality just doesn't capture the relevant notion of risk. So let's consider a case where this claim has been made by a black defendant with a compass score of nine. And let's just suppose to make the math easy that that score is associated in, this, in a calibrated tool with a 90% chance of rearrest. In the real world, it's not that accurate, which is itself a huge problem. In any case, a decision based on this classification has a 10% chance of being incorrect. That's what we know from the 90% accuracy of the score of nine. And so this defendant, when a decision was made based on that score was subjected to a 10% chance of being needlessly detained. The question is whether this unfairness claim is going to be stronger for groups that have a higher false positive rate. And I think there are some clues that it's not. First, because Compass doesn't use race and is calibrated according to race, then if we switch the race of this defendant, it wouldn't affect the score that they got. And so they would still be subject to this 10% risk of a false positive. Secondly, let's consider whether this complaint would go away if the same decision had been made about them in a different jurisdiction. So suppose it's a jurisdiction where the base rate of rearrest is actually lower for black defendants. It seems very strange that the force of this complaint would go away in such a jurisdiction. Intuitively, in both cases, this defendant has been subjected to the same risk of needless detention. And I think what's going on here is that fairness claims based on the false positive rate are linking risk of error to the wrong thing, base rate. Now, plenty of factors leading to base rate differences are unfair. I mean, the base rate differences that ProPublica is unearthing are themselves the results of all kinds of terrible injustice and unfairness. So I think that false positive rate is a symptom. But that doesn't mean that false positive rate inequality is a good measure of procedural fairness. I think that claims based on false positive rate inequality are just tracking the wrong thing. And now I want to consider various uh, things that would happen if you still were inclined to think that this is a fairness measure that gives you reason to adjust to reduce it. So I think one reason false positive rate inequality is so plausible in the compass case is because so many unfair things are going on and it kind of recommends the right adjustments and then we address these things. But if we want this to be a general fairness measure, we should ask what it would look like in other contexts. So imagine that we didn't have <coughs> such an oppressive and terrible criminal justice system and there was a good procedure where high-risk defendants were assigned social workers and given a cash transfer. So same predictor but a different decision process. This, of course, would, would still give you false positive rate inequality and false negative rate inequality. But if you really cared about equalizing false positive rates, that would mandate setting a higher threshold in this case. But in this case, the higher threshold is for who you're going to try to benefit. Or imagine a procedure for reporting possible insider trading. I'm guessing that 
rich people have a much higher base rate of insider trading, and so they too would be subject to the false positive rate uh, inequality. I don't think there's e anything even prima facie unfair about that, but if you did care about equalizing false positive rates, you'd think that you would have to raise the decision threshold in this case. And so this is just something I was just saying. I think in the Compass case, false positive rate equality is mandating plausible changes. It's alerting to us, us to the fact that the criminal justice system is hideously unfair, and we need to detain fewer black defendants. So in this case, it points in the right direction. But that's because the group with the higher base rate is also the mistreated group. And so it lines up in that case. But it's going to fail quite badly when we extend it to other domains, because those two things can come apart. And so if we're going to make fairness sensitive to base rates, we're going to get all sorts of adjustments that just don't track what we really care about. And what we care about are the interests of the people who are undergoing these procedures. And so I think when we're looking at adjusting thresholds and tools to make things fair, we should be adjusting, adjusting based on group-specific interests, but not on base rates, per se. I'm almost out of time, so that means that I can't tell you too much about how uh, this is all very complicated and there's a lot more I need to think about. One complication is that, and in, in the real world this is not at all a trivial complication, this process is supposed to fairly assess the risk of recidivism, and that means actually committing a crime while you're out on bail. But of course, Compass can't measure that. All Compass can measure is rearrest. And there's not a straightforward pattern between rearrest and recidivism. In fact, there's, in many places, probably all places in the US, a biased relationship between those. And so if decision makers are taking Compass to straightforwardly measure risk of committing a crime, instead of just measuring rearrest, then it is going to be a miscalibrated predictor of the thing that they care about. And I think that's another reason that uh, people have rightly picked up on the fact that there's something unfair going on with Compass. You'll also notice that I was using uh, decision theory and words like expected value, but it's very hard to know how you're supposed to do expected value calculations when you're not just thinking about how good things will go for people or how badly they'll go. Criminal justice isn't just about benefits and harms, it's quite plausibly about duties and rights. And this is just a nice, nice quote from a recent uh, paper by Seth Lazar, uh, which is just saying that this is something we really need to work out, and I certainly haven't worked it out. Um, he says, in a world where advances in AI have generated a compelling demand for formal versions of ethical theories adapted to decision-making under risk, it is more crucial than ever that deontologists explain how to systematically deal with duty under doubt. And I think pretrial detention is such a case because you're acting under uncertainty where rights are at stake. <coughs> and so I think this here is a good case for the relevance of philosophy for algorithmic decision making, which maybe Ruben is going to tell us about later today. Making it even more complicated, it's not just that we're mixing rights and benefits, we're also mixing defendant concerns with societal concerns, and it's not clear how and when you can weigh those things against each other. This is just to say that this is an extremely hard problem that every decision <laughs> is going to face. Everyone is going to have to set a threshold, and it's a very subtle and difficult problem to know where you're going to set the threshold. Certainly, focusing on false positive rates, I don't think is going to make this problem any easier. This is just Another general problem, something that I hope people here have been working on, is what features of people may we permissibly use as evidence, especially in the legal context. And again, the Corpus case raises all sorts of hard questions here. Should you be allowed to predict based on an arrest history that may itself be biased? Should you be able to predict that someone is more likely to be rearrested because they're young? And so there's a debate about how much we care about accuracy and when we're willing to trade accuracy for not considering certain features. But again, I think this is separate from the fairness measures question, although I'd be happy to hear uh, any objections. Just one last bit of miscellany that I wanted to point people to. This is not the first time that there has been a debate about the central impossibility. So when I wrote this paper, I realized that since this is a general phenomenon, people discovered this quite a long time ago. And there was actually like a national congressional <laughs> hearing about the central impossibility as it arises in employment 
The same thing will happen with employment testing if you have different base rates of various qualifications. And so, uh, yeah, this is just an interesting literature that I wanted to point people to. I think I'm right about at time, so just to recap what I have said, I think the calibration is a necessary condition for procedural fairness. I think the false positive rate equality is not a good measure of procedural fairness, even though it's often a symptom of unfairness. And I think that adjusting for, for false positive rate equality is just going to track the wrong things. We should be tracking the interests of the people in the procedure and not base rates, which false positive rate equality is necessarily going to track. Uh, thank you. There is a paper version of this if you want to read it and un un uncover more objections or complications. And uh, that's all we got. Hand out because I'm old fashioned. Are we going to do the check and answer? What have people been doing? All right. So, um, so thanks a lot for a rich and insightful uh, thought and broadly sympathetic to his argument. Um, so, he makes two main claims in the paper. So, first, calibration is a necessary condition for procedural fairness. And second, false positive equality is neither necessary nor sufficient. So, I'm going to focus on the First claim that calibration is a requirement of procedural fairness. Um, I'm going to raise three questions about the more positive part of the proposal. So, first, a uh, question about how we should understand the calibration condition. Second, a question about the argument for the calibration condition. And third, uh, a question about its implications. Um, so, first, uh, question one what kind of calibration is required for procedural fairness? And so, um, Rob just mentioned some of the issues here. So, initially, the paper version defines calibration as follows. Calibration is a statistical property, which means that a given compass score corresponds to the same frequency of re-arrest regardless of the race of the defendant. Okay, so that's how uh, North Point was understanding calibration. Um, and as you saw, he argues that this is not the kind of calibration that is required for procedural fairness. So um, instead, we should be uh, calibrating on recidivism risk, not risk of re-arrest. That's the right way to understand the calibration condition. So that, that seems uh, the way correct things to <coughs> Um, but it's not entirely clear what it means to say that two individuals, X and Y, are equally likely to reoffend, that they have the same recidivism risk. Um, and I'm going to mention three ways we might understand um, recidivism risk for purposes of thinking about the calibration condition and raise a couple of questions about each. And so I'll be putting to Rob how he wants us to understand that. So, um, first way is an objective way. So we could think of recidivism risk as um, some sort of property of individuals or a relationship between individuals and their environment. Um, and if so, um, I would want to hear more about how we should understand that property um, and how we should go about trying to measure it. And then the next two options are going to be more subjective. So not objective ways of understanding it, subjective epistemic ways of thinking about it. So uh, second, we might say that individuals X and Y are equally likely to reoffend. If and only if, given our actual evidence and background beliefs, it is rational to have the same credence that they already have. Um, and then the question would be whose evidence and background beliefs are relevant. Um, and third, we might say that two individuals have the same recidivism risk, just in case, given the evidence and background beliefs that we ought to have, it's rational to have the same credence that they're going to reoffend. So to believe, something like to believe that they're equally likely to reoffend. Um, and if so, um, the question is what determines what evidence and background beliefs we ought to have. I mean, how should we figure that out? All right, question two. Why is calibration a requirement of procedural fairness? Um, so here I'm going to invite Rob to just unpack the intuitive argument that they gave a little bit more. So why should we think that calibration is a requirement of procedural fairness when it comes to using compass in pretrial detention decisions? So in the paper he says, a miscalibrated predictor, when embedded in the decision process, subjects members of different groups with the same risk profile to different risks of harm or rights violations. So this is supposed to be clearly unfair. Um, there's certainly an intuition that this is unfair, um, but we might unpack the moral reasoning behind that intuition in different ways. Um, so one way to get from the uh, thought behind the quote to the conclusion that calibration is a requirement of procedural fairness is via the following claim. If X and Y have similar risk profiles, then procedural fairness requires treating X and Y in similarly favorable ways for purposes of making pre-trial detention decisions. I think this is a natural way of understanding the reason. Um, so what's the underlying motivation for that? Perhaps it's the following argument. First premise, this is just a popular condition on procedural fairness from the philosophical literature. 
procedure for performing a decision task of type T is procedurally fair only if the procedure treats all people that are similar in all T relevant respects in similarly favorable ways. So this is sometimes called the idea that fairness requires treating similar people similarly to the worst of other people. Um, if we accept that and we accept the following linking premise, we get claim. If X and Y have similar risk profiles, then X and Y are similar in all respects that are relevant to pretrial detention decisions. Um, so, uh, question, is this the right way to understand the paper's argument that calibration is a necessary condition of procedural fairness? Um, and if it is, then there's a worry here because you might think that um, the reason people have the risk profiles they in fact have uh, has often in many cases something to do with uh, historical injustice, present injustice, um, and that might make you worried about P2. Okay, question three, is it possible to satisfy the calibration condition? So clearly we can't directly perfectly detect when people commit crimes, as Rob mentioned. Um, instead we have to rely on uh, unreliable, imperfect proxies. Um, and that might make you think that in practice the calibration condition is going to be impossible to satisfy. Um, and then follow up question about like, what its implications are supposed to be for questions about when it's morally impermissible to use tools like Compass. And I think there are various things that can say. Um, but thanks, Rob. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I agree with the spirit of all these questions, and I think uh, thinking through them is going to really improve this project. So um, on question one, uh, what kind of calibration is required for procedural fairness? Um, in particular, what, what should we mean by individuals X and Y being equally likely to reoffend? Um, I definitely don't think that I want to go with one, which is like an objective chance kind of thing. Um, I think justifying whether I want to go with two or three probably depends on all sorts of uh, complicated things about uh, like subjective oughts and subjective evidence. I think I'm inclined to go with number three. So just to uh, cash that out, um, so I think if decision makers had like systematically bad evidence about the thing that they were making decisions about, and they were maybe foreseeably having bad evidence or having bad evidence for blameworthy reasons, I think then there would be a complaint that they were using a process that had that evidence, and that seems unfair. Um, it's harder to know what we would say about cases where there were people blamelessly uh, had the wrong evidence and wrong background beliefs. Um, but yeah, I, I think, and I think this fits with like the sort of decision theoretic framework I was using, I think this should be defined subjectively. So if you have like a rational credence that X and Y have the same uh, chance of reoffending, then you ought to treat them similarly. So that, that would be closest to three. Um, on question two, I definitely endorse that uh, reconstruction of the argument. Um, and I like the formalism of T relevant respects, and I, because I think that captures T relevant respects can also include how bad errors are for you. Um, and so it shows nicely when you might not want uniform decision thresholds. Um, what to do when people have similar risk profiles but for different reasons? I think I can't even begin to answer right now. I think that's a very good question. Um, to answer that, I think we're going to have to do some like heavy-duty theorizing about how much we care about accuracy on the one hand, and whether there are reasons to be less accurate or to like count different evidence that has different causal origins in different ways. Um, but I think it would be good just to make that trade-off uh, explicit in the framework. Uh, Question three, uh, I also think I want to punt on ultimately answering that question. I think it's a great one. I will say one thing which is that people have pointed out, which is that there's at least a less problematic relationship between violent crime and arrest. At least empirically, it seems like there's a less skewed relationship. And that also fits nicely with the fact that pretrial detention should probably only be used for risk of like grave, possibly violent offenses. So that would help a little bit with this problem although it wouldn't fully go away. So I'm actually agnostic on question three 